and thank you so much for attending this. This is the first time I've given this talk, so uh, it's a little rough around the edges, and I very much would like some feedback from you. The topic is about conspiracy thinking in the age of Trump. I chose that title for several reasons. The first is probably obvious. President Trump dominates, dominates national and international discussion for the last two years. He's the focus of nearly every news cycle. His words and deeds have touched national as well as international leaders. We hear him upon the Main Street. We also hear him around Christmas and Thanksgiving tables. I also chose the title because Donald Trump has raised repeatedly the specter of conspiracy in America. No other president has more consistently and persistently raised the specter and mined the rhetoric of conspiracy. Because of the time limits on this talk, I'm going to focus my words and ideas on President Trump. I hope in the question and answer session some people might want to ask me about liberal or left-wing conspiracy theories at the same time. So I'd like to begin by giving you some context, by examining the context of American history and asking how American history has prepared the ground for Donald Trump. I want to suggest that Donald Trump's words and warnings have power have importance, have influence, because they resonate and they echo basic core ideas of American history and the American people. At the same time, I want to argue that we're witnessing a new phase of conspiracy telling in America. It's highlighted by a new means of dissemination of conspiracy theories, and it's intensified by a legion of surrogates in the United States. And finally, I want to argue that the end of this conspiracy theory, conspiracy thinking, and conspiracy telling is not to persuade, but rather to validate and secure identity. So let's begin. The cry of conspiracy is not new in American history. It goes back to the very beginnings of American history when our folks got off the boat in 1607 and 1619. The ground, as I said, has been well prepared for over 400 years. Donald Trump's claims of conspiracy play well, play well in a nation long conditioned to believe that hidden, secret, diabolical groups, intelligent groups, are bent upon destroying the American experiment, that's bent upon destroying the American nation. Conspiracy theorists believe that such groups move and shape events, that such groups bend history to their will. They employ violence, depression, recession, war. They manipulate elections. They foster immigration in a thirst for power and control and wealth. Now, just a footnote. We are moving beyond the legal definition of conspiracy, which involves two or more people plotting or or creating an act that is illegal. We're looking at larger conspiracies, global conspiracies, conspiracies that seek to shape and destroy a nation. Now, while conspiracy thinking is not unique to the United States, we must look to American core values and core beliefs in order to understand the lasting power of conspiracy <laughs> thinking and conspiracy theories. And I want to outline three basic American beliefs and values that shape conspiracy thinking. The first is America's sense of mission, the idea of American exceptionalism, that America has a special role to play in history, has a special role on the world stage throughout the decades and throughout the centuries. Whether that's raising up God's kingdom in the 16th and 17th century, or following manifest destiny in the 19th century, or a more secular way, winning American, winning people to America's ways of freedom, justice and democracy around the world in the 20th and 21st centuries. We believe we're doing God's work. We believe we're doing civilization's work. But as we all know, when you're doing God's work and civilization work, that draws the enemies. That draws Satan's minions. That draws the evildoers. That draws the axis of evil, or as it's more recently called, the trio of tyranny. Conspiracies which seek to destroy America. A second main core value and belief, and that is American diversity. 
American diversity, our strength as an amalgam of people. Yet for those who are suspicious, for those who are watchful, it means in this diversity that the enemy is within. The enemy has come to our shores. The enemy is within the gates of America. Loyal not to the American experiment, not to American values, but rather to other gods, to other lords, and to other kings. American suspiciousness looks at diversity as a curse. A third key value, a third key belief, and that is a fear of centralized power in America. From the colonial period to the present, Americans fear central power. You know, Americans are able to quote three Brits, Shakespeare, John Lennon, and Lord Acton. And Lord Acton said, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The idea is when power is given to the ministers of government, they grow greedy for more power. They grow greedy for more control and more authority. And they become corrupted in this quest for authority and power. And in this corruption, they foist a tyranny upon the people and forge, if you will, chains upon the American people. And the fears of this we can find so easily. It's evidence in our core documents. In the Declaration of Independence, chap excuse me, paragraph two, there is a sentence that says, devious designs, devious designs carried forth by the king and his ministers. If you look at the Constitution of the United States, there is also this fear of power. And with our, as a result, we have a separation and division of power. We have a checks and balances system. We have a written bill of rights. The fear of centralized power was first voiced by Tom Jefferson and Tom Paine. It's echoed by Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan. The idea is American liberty depends on vigilance. American liberty depends on watchfulness, even suspiciousness. And I would argue then we look at the NRA today and the love and the defense of the Second Amendment, much of this is involved in the idea that the federal government is out to take away our liberties and rights. Fear of centralized power, fear of diversity, the idea of America's mission. These are the factors that have powered and energized the conspiracy theories that have been raised up over the decades and over the centuries. Note the long history of conspiracy thinking in America. Note the targets. Salem witches, Native Americans, British ministers, Catholics, Jews, Mormons, Bolsheviks, slaves and slaveholders, Wall Street bankers, Japanese Americans, black radicals, anti-war activists, Muslim Americans, all have in their turn and over time, and among many other plotters, been accused been accused of conspiring against America. With this as background, let us turn to President Trump. For Donald Trump, the sweep of conspiracy is vast. Barack Obama was his first target. President Trump, at the time candidate Trump, questioned Barack Obama's American birth and citizenship, the birth of conspiracy. Barack Obama was a pretender. Barack Obama was an imposter. Barack Obama was less than an American. Now there's a theme behind this. And the real theme of the conspiracy is this. Whose hidden hands manipulated and engineered the rise of a foreigner to the highest office in the United States? The reference is, and made often, to a 1962 film called The Manchurian Candidate. And that is that a traitor has been planted at the very core of the American government in the presidency. And this traitor is subject to the will of global power makers and power brokers. When we talk about liberal conspiracy theories, it's the same idea of a Manchurian candidate, however manipulated by the Russians. Others took the bait. Others expanded the indictment. He was not simply a Kenyan. He was not simply not an American. Barack Obama was a Muslim. 
And some went even further. Barack Obama was the Antichrist. Nearly 60% of Republicans are convinced that Barack Obama is not a citizen of the United States and therefore should be disqualified from the presidency. The birth of conspiracy became a litmus test of loyalty to Donald Trump. It was not a litmus test of loyalty to conservatism, but rather a litmus test of loyalty to Donald Trump. It became, if you will, the true cross of Trumpism. Turning to the 2016 campaign, Donald Trump, the candidate, charged the following. American Muslims were concealing evidence of crimes committed by their co-religionists. Donald Trump charged. TV shows Saturday Night Live and The Daily Show had collaborated with the mainstream press and were engaged in what he called a concerted effort to destroy him. Donald Trump charged that Ted Cruz's father knew Lee Harvey Oswald and participated in the Kennedy assassination. The candidate Trump charged that Democrats were voting illegal immigrants from Mexico. He charged that climate change was a Chinese hoax. He charged that Paul Ryan had made a sinister deal with Democrats and the press. He charged that Hillary Clinton had a hidden microphone at their debate. He also said that she was clearly suffering from either dementia, Parkinson's disease, or epilepsy, and that fact had been concealed by her staff in league with the press. Meanwhile, Donald Trump, as a candidate, foreshadowed his attacks on what he would call the deep state. Specifically, the National Security Agency had Hillary Clinton's missing emails. The election was rigged, rampant, and covered up voter fraud. President Obama had tapped his phones in Trump Tower. The FBI conspired to prevent his victory. The Bureau of Labor Statistics was issuing false employment numbers to buoy up the Democrats. And the National Park Service had colluded with the press to give out low attendance records and numbers at his inaugural. At the end of the 2016 campaign, in late October, a new conspiracy theory emerged, a more insidious conspiracy theory. The focus was on a man named George Soros. George Soros, who is a financier and philanthropist, a major contributor to liberal causes, and a Jewish American. It's not a surprise that he was a target because he supported the Democratic Party. But what was surprising was the kind of attack he made, and that was, again, on his Jewishness. Said Donald Trump, George Soros, Janet Yellen, and Lloyd Blankfein, all Jews, were actually part of the global power elite, and that they had damaged the US economy and were enriching themselves off the backs of American workers. This re allowed old images and old fears to rear up. The old fears, the old images of a secret Jewish cabal, the elders of Zion who controlled the world, international insiders whose money manipulated elections. For those sensitive to anti-Semitism, these images and words conjured up the words of the propagandists in Nazi Germany who talked about Jewish parasites and Jewish bloodsuckers destroying the workers of the German Republic. As president, as president, Trump ramped up his attacks. He said that Soros had bankrolled National Football League athletes who took the knee during the national anthem. He accused Soros of paying the actors to disrupt the Kavanaugh hearings and to confront the senators in the elevators. He accused Soros of funding a caravan of people from Latin America in what he called an invasion of the United States. He was, said Trump, the mastermind and the puppet master, designed to trick Americans in league, in league with the American press, which he called 
the enemies of the people. He also portrayed as a conspiracy the Mueller investigation. In fact, the New York Times today indicated that uh, Donald Trump has made more than 1,100 tweets and pu public comments attacking the Mueller investigation in the last year and a half. The Mueller investigation says Trump is actually an attempted coup by angry Democrats upset about the election, the angry press, and with the deep state collaborators in the FBI and the Department of Justice. It was, he said, a rigged witch hunt, a frame up, made up evidence, a smear. The irony of all this is that the Mueller investigation has found a real conspiracy of at least 12 Russian operatives and some Americans. That a real conspiracy has been unearthed by the th Southern District of New York in regard to illegal payoffs to the president's sexual partners and potential obstruction of justice claims as well. Now Trump is not the first president to use the language of secret cabals and hidden hands of enemies within. However, he is the most persistent and consistent. His net is spread the widest. Diverse peoples, institutions, the press, and government agencies. But he is unlike conspiracy theorists in the past. In the past, conspiracy theorists produced libraries. Libraries of books, articles, videotapes, and audio tapes to reveal complex plots. They compiled mounds of evidence, diagrams, appendices, footnotes, to prove and to persuade people of the conspiracy. For they believed the devil is in the detail. The idea was to connect the dots, to provide all the information you could to uncover the plot, the tracks of the plotters, so that Americans would be convinced. For Donald Trump, the devil is in the repetition. The details are unimportant. No proof is necessary. No proof is given. In sound bites and 250 character tweets, and note he has 57 million Twitter followers, he rapidly spins and immediately disseminates conspiracy claims. His is conspiracy shorthand. His claims command national and international attention and are unmediated. Their number numbs and blurs, numbs and blurs and denies fact checking and refutation. And the news cycle, as we all know, moves on. Eager to share every new confrontation, every new controversy, every new conspiracy. The president's style also limits accountability and denies responsibility. By instinct or preparation, he uses a rhetorical device which is called paralipsis. Paralipsis means saying something, saying something, but professing not to have said it. Paralipsis means drawing attention to a sensitive matter while seeming to pass over it. Paralipsis means conveying a message without taking responsibility for it. Listen to two examples. Asked about George Soros' alleged role in the caravan, this is on November the 4th, 2018. I don't know who, but I wouldn't be surprised. A lot of people say yes. After referencing a picture in the National Enquirer alleging that Ted Cruz's father was a friend of Lee Harvey Oswald, the assassin of John F. Kennedy, he said, what was he doing with Lee Harvey Oswald before the shooting? Horrible. Simply being president, simply being president, Trump commands attention and earns legitimacy. But he also claims to be the embattled hero of the people. He claims to be a Paul Revere warning Americans of the dangers within. He talks about speaking truth and standing up unbowed against border invaders, globalists, criminals, and bitter deep staters. His conspiracy theories are not about persuasion. Trump is not trying to convince anybody of anything. Again, his conspiracy claims are a litmus test. They're a marking and a making of identity. He is speaking, he is preaching to the converted, those who know, 
those who believe, and those already enlisted. He is using the rhetoric of conspiracy, slippery in logic and careless of facts and data, to separate friend from foe, shore up his base, and rally the troops. The president's conspiracy claims intensify when repeated by others, and Trump has his amen corner, or to use a more recent expression, he has his outrage industry. And this outrage industry exists on the left and the right. Taking leave from the wars on Christmas, the climate change debates, and other causes, cable television news, social media, talk radio, and internet blogs and websites have created an echo chamber repeating Trump's attacks. Among those who beat the drum and validate Trump's comments are the Fox lineup, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, Lou Dobbs. Also on radio, Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh, and Infowars, Alex Jones. And in the Senate and the House, Jason Chaffetz, Kevin McCarthy, Stephen King, Tom Cotton, and Dennis Nunes. They are more blatantly anti-Semitic, said Glenn Beck. Soros is the puppet master, the front man of the House of Rothschild, said minority leader Kevin McCarthy. He accused Soros and another Jew, Michael Blumberg, of buying the 2016 election. And then there's Fox Business News' Lou Dobbs, who references the neo-Nazi phrase Zog, which stands for Zionist Occupation Government, which supposedly controls the government in Washington, D.C. Says Dobbs, we must fight against the Soros-occupied State Department. Note, the margins and extremes have become mainstreamed. Note, the broadening of the borders of acceptable speech. Note also, this is not a one-way street of communication. Rumors, innuendo, misinformation, false facts, fake facts, lies, migrate from the fringes, from the alt-right sites, to the mainstream right of Fox News, to the White House. And the most recent example of this was the doctored video of Jim Acosta, the CNN reporter, who had a tussle with the White House aide. That doctored video actually came from Alex Jones's Infowars and eventually appeared in a briefing by Sarah Saunders. Let us not dismiss conspiracy theories as harmless or merely foolish, nor in light of the long tradition of conspiracy thinking in America, lightly to easily disappear. Conspiracy thinking demonizes public officials and erodes faith in public institutions. For conspiracy theorists, opponents are not simply wrong or misguided. Rather, they have betrayed America. They have committed treason. In such an atmosphere, negotiation and compromise become impossible. For patriots cannot negotiate with evildoers. The loss of faith and trust in American institutions has gone beyond healthy skepticism. I quote a poll first taken in 1958 by the Gallup organization. In 1958, Americans were asked, do you trust the government to do what is right all or most of the time? In 1958, 75% of Americans said, I trust the government to do what is right all or most of the time. And we've seen, as this poll has been taken every single year since 1958, a decline through the Vietnam years, through the Kennedy assassination years, through Watergate, through Iran-Contra, through the Clinton scandals. Until today, as in 2018, the poll now stands at 18% of Americans believe that the government is trying to do the right thing all or most of the time. This is not a matter of history. This is not the past. This is not something we can simply forget about. This is our present. Witness what it has spawned. Two-thirds of Trump's supporters believe Obama is a Muslim. 50% of Republicans believe that the federal government should, should shut down CNN and the New York Times. Recall the events of Charlottesville 
and the presidential response. Remember Cesar Sayak, bomb maker before the November 2018 elections, obsessed with George Soros. Remember the synagogue shootings in Pittsburgh by Robert Bowers, obsessed with what he called Jewish infestation of America. In 2017, anti-Semitic hate crimes were up 60%, the biggest increase since the tracking had begun in 1979. And at Trump rallies, witness what appears on signs and on T-shirts, and that's the words QAnon. QAnon are the people who've been attacking the media at these rallies. The QAnon people believe that Trump is God's messenger and sword. It is his destiny, they believe, to destroy the Soros finance plot of the deep staters, the Democrats, the globalists, the pedophiles, the drug traffickers, and the gun opponents. Their plot to rule America. It is he, they believe, who will usher in a new great awakening, which will bring the United States back to God and the Constitution. And note, this in a nation armed to the teeth. The response to all of this, in my mind, for the majority of Americans, is education about the dangers of conspiracy thinking the blackness and whiteness of the thinking, the monolithic thinking. To realize that this is a war on American institutions, a war on faith in America's institutions. We must inoculate ourselves from this disease that's happening to destroy the nation from within. But to the 25 to 30 percent of diehards of true believers who need no convincing about the conspiracies. The issue is to confront and the issue is to repudiate. Always repeatedly, always repeatedly to defend U.S. institutions and to restore faith in our institutions. We must not by default, we must not by default by fatigue or frustration let conspiracy thinking become the conventional wisdom. Thank you. Thank you for your talk today. It was very eloquent. Um, I wonder uh, what connection, if any, you see between that rather alarming 18% statistic of present faith in government and Reagan-esque rhetoric from the 80s that says government is always the problem. Thank well, you. Th th that's, that's a good, thank you for that question. And uh, that Reagan-esque uh, rhetoric actually began in the early 1950s in regard to uh, particularly Barry Goldwater and other Republicans at the time. And what's interesting also is there was a jump in faith in government, believe it or not, in the early 1980s because Ronald Reagan seemed to promise a new America and an America which you can believe in. And for a time, maybe two or three or four years, that was the case. But there is this idea, and Reagan's key line was, you know, the, the biggest joke in America is I asked the government for help and I waited for it to arrive. And uh, this was supposedly a, uh, an anti-government joke. But what I think has been most important in regard to understanding this drop in faith, because it's a faith not only in government, but in every American institution, in churches, in labor unions, in corporations, in the court system, and as I think you all know, in Congress. But what has happened since the 50s is a series of, if you will, debacles where Americans feel they've been lied to. And in many cases, they weren't told the truth, at least the whole truth. Whether it was the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964 in regard to the Vietnam War. Whether it was the Vietnam War where we constantly heard about the light at the end of the tunnel. The Kennedy assassination in 1963 has spawned hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces, books, articles, videotapes on the government cover-up in regard to this. Then you get into the 1970s and you have Richard Nixon and Watergate, a cover-up, an obstruction of justice where Americans lost faith in the government's ability to control evildoing, control corruption, and to get things done. Add the Iran-Contra problems in regard to Reagan and his administration lying to the American people. Add Clinton's material to that in the 1990s in regard to his, his sexual uh, dalliances. And you have this situation leading to 2001 where again you see a jump up in faith after the United States is attacked on 
But what happens after 9-11? You see all of these conspiracy theories, very powerful conspiracy theories, that the United States government knew what was happening and did nothing to stop it. So my concern is that we are now so wrapped in conspiracy theories that they've migrated from the extremes to the mainstream that we don't even worry about them being conspiracy theories. We almost jump at the belief in conspiracy theories. My concern also is the Trump administration, which not only propagates conspiracy theories, but potentially is involved in conspiracies, is going to make the situation even worse. Hi, uh, very insightful speech. I really enjoyed it. Um, throughout the speech, though, you talked a lot about the things that you feel that Trump has done wrong by the American people. I'm just curious, are there anything, or is there anything that you think that Trump has done right? Yes, I think the uh, recent passage of the bill in, reg in regard to crime uh, and the sentencing in prison was a very much of a step forward. I'm not thrilled with the loss of Bears Ears. I'm not thrilled with many of the things that have happened which seem to me to be impulsive or given to, uh, to uh, interests that I think are detrimental to not only the environment but to the American military. But I'm very pleased with the change in the, uh, the Reform Act in regard to crime. What would you suggest we do to help um, combat the automatic jump to belief in conspiracy theories? Boy, that's the greatest question of all. You know, I, I've been lecturing on conspiracy theories for about 20 years. And in the past, uh, I would talk repeatedly about the importance of education. And as a teacher, I'm very fixed on the idea that education is a key idea to move forward. I think somehow we have got to figure out a way, and maybe it's the Appomattox Project, to quiet the discourse, to shine less light on those things that divide us, and look for a common ground. Because, you know, in American history, we're constantly fighting with one another, okay? We had a civil war. The 1850s were make what's happening now look like kids play. But what unites us, unfortunately, in the past has always been war, that we're able to find a commonality to us and an American identity because we have somebody to oppose. I ho and the other, I guess the other piece is the Great Depression of the 1930s, where we all felt that we were in this together. And we haven't felt we've been in this together at least since the 1950s. And that means not just white folks are doing well, but black folks and brown folks and green folks are doing well too. But it's a new sense of who we are as a people. And I'm hoping what comes out of this conspiracy stuff, what comes out of the Trump years, is a, a revitalization of what America is. That America is more than just something for the privileged. That America is something that stands for its ideals and values, which as an American citizen, I hold dearly and I cherish. Whether that's going to come or not, I'm far more pessimistic than I used to be. Sir. There's a cottage, John. There's a cottage industry in fact checking now. There's a lot of information out there which would it tend to throw light on the issues that you raise, but there doesn't seem to be much of an audience or a forum for getting the word out. You know, we don't, you know, I blame this on departments of English. I hope there are no English professors here, okay? <laughs> but where, where we, there, there used to be some sense that there were facts we could all agree on. And now I'm told that I'm not really a historian, I just histori historicize and I, I worry about this, this, this lack of agreement. And I want to emphasize something because my comments were about Trump. But I could have given a talk on the outrage industry on the left, okay, which is also just wrapped up in its own anger. The right is wrapped up in its anger. The left is wrapped up in its own anger. We don't care about facts, okay? We care about identity, okay? And our identity, not as Americans, 
but our identities in each of these small pockets. It's almost as if we have this mosaic in front of us, and all we can see are the little pieces of the mosaic. And if you're only staring and focusing on the piece of the mosaic that's you, you have no sense of a commonality or a sense of community. You know, there was an article in the paper uh, last week where 45% of Americans, excuse me, Utahns, could pass a basic history test. And we're number sixth in the country, just behind South Dakota at 55%. We have lost the common threads. We're forgetting the common threads that bind us as a people. And I, as a historian, find that in our history. What has made us right? What has made us wrong in the past? What do we have to rekindle? And what do we have to stamp out? But if you don't know the past, and every day is a new day, and we only live in the present and the future, then the past ceases to be a guide, ceases to do anything for us. And to me, if you forget the past, if you forget what's happened, it doesn't repeat, but the past really echoes. So um, you mentioned the, uh, <coughs> the echo chamber and the media and social media in particular. Um, <coughs> what do you think would be a, a, uh, a solution in terms of opening up media discourse so that broader perspectives are available rather than you know relying solely on advertising revenue or cable ratings. Do you have any ideas <laughs> that would be consistent? Well, that, with that's a nice rhetorical the First question, Amendment, Dave. yeah. <laughs> I, I do want to say this: we all believe that the internet was going to be uh, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. Uh, what we do, we don't go to the internet for information. We go to the internet for confirmation. We find those websites which agree with our beliefs. And then we get fortified in our beliefs. And what the psychologists say is, the more you read about things that validate what you say, the more extreme you get in your positions. What I'm hoping happens in colleges and in high schools and in junior high schools and probably now in elementary schools is a better understanding of information, a better understanding of how to see and use information. But what is so essential, and I think what we're so afraid of, is hearing about somebody who, who, who disagrees with us, hearing about somebody who presents another opinion. The latest is, well, the left-wingers and the Democratic Party are socialists. Well, that immediately puts them beyond the pale of America, okay? But we just got to stop with the labels, and we've got to stop with the distrust. And we've got to, again, without depression and without war, come to a sense that what we have in common is more important than what divides us. You know, I use this expression constantly, which is, you don't have to stand shoulder to shoulder to see eye to eye, okay? What you need to do is understand another position. You might disagree with it. You might find it erroneous. But to discard it and to treat it as evil is something we've got to fight against. Um, that was an uh, excellent talk, by the way. Thank um, you. But how would you suggest that we balance the need to stop conspiracies while also not getting too readily to jump onto conspiracy theories? Because they both, if, if I understood you correctly, you're saying they're both bad, and I would agree with that. But I just want to know how, how would you recommend we find the balance between those two? Well, first realize there are real conspiracies. Okay? Julius Caesar was killed in a conspiracy. The Boston Tea Party was a conspiracy. Abe Lincoln was killed in a conspiracy. 9-11 was a conspiracy. And what gives conspiracies some life is the fact that we could say, wasn't that a real conspiracy? Conspiracies do occur. But what we have got to do is step back and rather than believe, we have to think. Because we've suspended thought. We've suspended the idea of reflection of is this accurate or is this accurate? What we've done is said, I'm in this camp, you're in this camp, and I accept. And this goes with my comment about identity. It's not about information in my mind anymore. It's about who we think we are. 
and who do we think opposes us. Education, in my mind, is the key factor, understanding what a conspiracy is, and not being duped, and I'll use a word from the 1950s, not being duped by ideas without having reflected upon them. So I was wondering, in that same vein... Could you speak a little louder? I was wondering, in that same vein, um, how much of this discourse do you think is method acting, where I'm a Republican, so I must think this way, or I'm a Democrat, and I must think this way, and how much is just absolutely believing and, and truly thinking uh, this way? Th that's, th that's really a good question. Uh, so I've interviewed uh, quite a few conspiracy theorists, and I find that these people believe what they say. I also realize that these people make a living by selling conspiracy theories, okay. that they are financially involved in their beliefs. I think it's incredibly important that we understand, again, and accept the sincerity of people. But at the same time, I am absolutely amazed by what I'll call political theater that exists in this country today. The, you know, Donald Trump said recently that he calls on Jim Acosta because he wants the back and forth, because he knows he's on stage. And Jim Acosta plays the willing role of aggravated CNN reporter. Okay. We have got to look at what we're seeing. Really look at what we're seeing. I meant to say it that way. Look at what we're seeing and realize so much of this is acting, playing roles, giving us what we, they think we want. And we've got to come to a point where we say, this is not governing. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, this is not governing. This is not solving problems. This is not moving the country forward but it's up to us. And I hope you're all voters. And I know after a variety of things in the state legislature and other things that are occurring that you think your vote doesn't mean a damn. But that is your voice. And a whole lot of Americans have died over time defending your voice and defending your vote. And it's frustrating. I can't begin to tell you how many elections my candidates have lost in the years I've been voting. But I vote every damn time because that's, A, my witnessing the sacrifice that Americans have done for me. But it's also a realization that if you want this country, if you want this country to go forward, you've got to participate in it. You can't step aside. You can't step back. You can't sit, but you've got to act. I don't know what that meant. <laughs>